afternoon's session on uh, Full Stack Reactive Java with Spring Framework 5, Spring Boot 2, and Project Reactor. I like really short titles, so I just start with that. Uh, my name is Mark Heckler. I'm a principal technologist and Spring developer advocate with Pivotal Software Inc. Uh, Pivotal are the makers of such fine software uh, components as the Spring Framework, Spring Boot, uh, Redis, RabbitMQ, Greenplum, Gemfire, huge contributor to Apache Tomcat, huge contributor to the Cloud Foundry common code line. You may have heard of us. Uh, we're a tiny little startup in Silicon Valley who just went public, by the way. We just IPO'd a few weeks ago, which makes the financial folks extremely excited. I'm still doing the same thing I was the day before, so yeah, it's all good. Uh, I blog, uh, admittedly, not as often as I would like, but, you know, I'm trying to get better. It's a new year, still sort of. You know, we're in the first half. I guess it still counts. Uh, but I blog semi-regularly at thehecklers.com. Uh, I tweet very regularly, though, at MKHeck. Uh, is anyone here on Twitter? Twitter? Come on. Uh, OK, it's, it's 2018. It's time. Uh, Twitter actually turned a profit for the first time last year, so I think it's here for the long haul. It's safe. Jump in now. It's where your favorite open source committers hang. Uh, I jokingly said, uh, I guess it was, yeah, last month, that there are some months that I spend more time on Twitter than I do at home. And I <laughs> went back to my hotel room, <laughs> and I figured it up. And actually, in April and May, I actually did spend more time on Twitter than at home. So uh, it's a little sad, actually. But, but Twitter, it's the place to be. Uh, we only have 50 minutes here today, which is a rather shortish amount of time. Uh, the good news is we have a lot of time afterwards. If you have any questions, comments, or feedback, Twitter is the best way to reach me. Uh, I live on Twitter from sunup to sundown, and at times in between, I have been known to wake up in the middle of the night, reach over uh, to my nightstand in the hotel room, pick up my phone, and tweet. Uh, again, probably another sad statement of my life, but there it is. Uh, so please do reach out to me on Twitter. I'm very responsive there. But uh, if your uh, feedback doesn't fit in 280 characters, or you hate Twitter, or what have you, I'm also a member of the slightly older and more established social network called email. Is anyone on email? Good. OK, it's going to be big one of these days, I'm sure. They keep telling me that. Uh, I actually have, like you, about a half a dozen different email addresses. But these are my two favorites, uh, mark at the .com. I actually have both the .org and the .com site, so I had to check which one I listed. Uh, and mheckler at pivotal.io. Uh, these are the two that I check the least infrequently. So I'm not on email every day, multiple times a day, throughout the night. But I do, che do check it from time to time. So if you have any uh, feedback, please do reach out to me there. It's fine. Uh, just give me a couple days to respond. Um, so before I get into this, actually, I, uh, if I could, I need to, uh, to ask if I could get a selfie. Because I like to prove to my boss that I'm actually doing something here <laughs> instead of just sampling the coffee scene, which, by the way, is excellent. Uh, but, uh, but if I could get uh, a, a selfie here, let's try this side of the room first. Everybody say, spring. And this side, say, reactor. See, that was even harder, and that sounded louder. That was, I don't know, you guys, come on, step it up. Anyway, uh, so, uh, so now I have proof. So we're done. Any questions? Oh, OK. Um, I am, uh, I guess, a little background on me. Uh, who am I? I am um, an author. I have, uh, I've authored several blogs and blog posts. I've co-authored a couple of books. I have another project in, in process, actually, a, a video uh, a course that I'm going to be releasing on Spring Cloud Stream here soon-ish. Uh, so if you'd like to hear more announcements on that, please do follow me on Twitter. That's where I announce everything first. Uh, again, I live on Twitter. Uh, I am a frequent conference speaker, and I go where I'm invited. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me here. Uh, go to is awesome. Any any first timers? I guess I should ask that. Yeah. What do you think so far? Pretty awesome, right? Uh, so hopefully they'll invite us all back. They'll let us come back. Uh, hope hope so anyway. Um, I am an architect and developer, and as you might guess from the next bullet point, where most of my expertise has been won, it's in the realm of Java. Uh, I was. Uh, voted into the Java Champions a few years ago now, three years ago maybe, uh, for ongoing contributions to the greater Java community. Uh, so if you had anything to do with that, if you voted for me, appreciate it. I appreciate the vote of confidence. And I am a seeker of a better way, as are you, or you wouldn't be here. Um, our industry has shiny object syndrome, right? We, we are constantly fixating on the new hotness. But, uh, and that's bad in general, right? But it is important to learn new things. 
Because by learning new things, we sometimes find solutions to problems that were previously intractable. We find better ways of doing things. And if we don't venture out of our comfort zone, we can never possibly learn those things. Uh, I love an old, I'm kind of a quote, uh, quote nut, so I love an old quote by Washington Irving, which is uh, something along the lines of, uh, when traveling by stagecoach, it's often good to shift and be bruised in a new place. Uh, I know nothing about traveling by stagecoach, but I think the lesson is here, here is, is valid. Uh, it's good to shift. It's good to uh, get uncomfortable so we can uh, broaden our tool set and our, our, uh, our expertise, right? So we can solve more problems better. So uh, today, what are we talking about? Great question. OK, reactive programming. So I love this quote by uh, Project Reactor team member Rosson Stoyanchev, in which he says, in a nutshell, reactive programming is about non-blocking event-driven applications that scale with a small number of threads, with back pressure as a key ingredient, that aims to ensure that producers do not overwhelm consumers. Now that packs in a lot of information in a single quote, which is awesome, right? But let's unpack it a little bit. Uh, first, reactive programming is, reactive programming is about non-blocking event-driven applications. Uh, a little history is in order here, and again, I'm kind of a history nut as well, uh, but I will shorten this because the more I talk, the less I get to code, and I love code. I hope you do too, so. Um, but in the Java ecosystem, typically we've had a bit of an artificial, artificial um, const construction, right? Uh, at the operating system level, typically everything operates asynchronously. And yet, within Java, the JVM, which sits on top of an operating system, we've had this construct uh, which tends to have a model of scaling out by increasing the number of threads via multi-threading, right? So the more requests that come in, for each request, typically you have another thread that spawn, and then we, we have this massive number of threads at any given point in time, most of which are what? are idle, right? They're waiting on something else. They're waiting on uh, a response from a database, from an operating system, from a, a, maybe an API call. Uh, so it's, it's very easy to reason about, right? I mean, you typically make a request and you wait, and then when it comes back, you proceed. So that's, that's nice, it's helpful. Um, but it's not terribly efficient, right? Uh, with a reactive model, you don't have that. Now, asynchronous programming has been around for a while, right? But it's been a little messy, understatement. Right? Uh, asynchronous programming has led us to lovely terms, endearing terms, like callback hell. Uh, things like that, that, uh, that if you've ever had to do as asynchronous programming in the typical model, it's been a little rough around the edges, right? Uh, with reactive programming, it tends to adopt a much cleaner look while giving you the advantages of asynchronicity. Uh, it allows you to scale with a small number of threads. This is kind of important, right? I think Node showed us all in the Java community what a small number of threads, of what a thread can do. Uh, but you also have the problem of a thread, right? So we don't want to repeat necessarily that mistake, but we do want to take some of those lessons learned from the Node community. Uh, back pressure is what I feel like is kind of the number one thing that separates reactive programming from asynchronous programming. Because asynchronous programming doesn't in and of itself involve back pressure. There's no way for a slower moving consumer to push back, to say, hey, look, I can only take two values at a time, or five values at a time, or whatever the magic number is. Uh, so back pressure is very important. It doesn't mean that you won't still have publishers or producers that are producing a massive number of, of values that a perhaps, perhaps a slower subscriber can't deal with, but it does shift the responsibility for what you're going to do with the intermittent number of values to the publisher, which is typically where we have a little bit more control, right? Um, I, I do want to kind of explain this as I go, but this gives you a little bit of a taste of where we're going with the idea of reactive programming in general. Now, as I mentioned, I love history, so I used to talk about all the history that built up to the now, but again, that takes a bit of time. And then I realized something as well, because at, at, at one point in time, uh, there were a group of very intelligent people who released a thing, a glorious thing, called the Reactive Manifesto. Now, in our industry, nothing truly ever happened before a manifesto was created, right? So we can ignore, safely ignore all the history up until that point. Is anybody out there? OK, I, I should have, I guess, led with that you will hear the worst jokes in any language here today in my talk that you will, you will hear anywhere. 
So that was a joke. I can tell because I got absolute silence, but, but that's okay. Um, but, so we had a manifesto, and then, then history began, the world began. Uh, so, so a lot of smart folks got together and said, you know, really, we could concentrate on a lot of things, uh, but, but where we really need to turn our focus is on the interactions, the streams, if you will, because that's where most of the inefficient waiting takes place. So some companies got together, uh, companies who had really, organizations as well, uh, who had come up with ways to solve these issues, but they were all done differently. And there's, a, there's an old um, uh, term coined by Ray Norda, former head of Novell. Does anyone remember Novell? Any other old timers in the room besides me? Okay. Uh, Novell was, well, may still be around, I don't know, now that I think about that, I think it is. Uh, but Ray Norda headed this company for years, uh, way back, and he, ter he coined the term coopetition, which I love. The idea of coopetition is valuable because you can still compete with your competitors while you can still cooperate with them so that your customers don't get caught in the crossfire, which is smart, right? I mean, we're developers. We don't necessarily care if company A doesn't like company B or they don't get along and the developers don't talk. We just want our stuff to work. So uh, several companies got together and created the Reactive Streams Initiative based upon the outputs of the Reactive uh, Manifesto. So you had companies like Pivotal, uh, like uh, Lightman, Nay, Typesafe, uh, Kazing, Twitter, um, Red Hat. I think even Oracle finally came on board, right? Uh, thus, we had the Java Util, Java Util Concurrent Flow in Java 9. Uh, but the Reactive Stream specification was born out of a desire to perhaps solve things differently, but to be compatible, to work together in the resolution of these things. So there are four parts to the Reactive Streams initiative. One is the, uh, the specification itself, the textual spec. One is the API. Another is the examples that are used to kind of showcase uh, the API. And fourth is perhaps the most important, which is the TCK, the Technology Compatibility Kit. And that's what allows you to demonstrate your compliance or lack of compliance or things you need to fix or work with in terms of your implementation of the Reactive Streams initiative. Now, what is, what are Reactive Streams? There are four interfaces defined, and it, they're very simple, right? You have a publisher, uh, which kind of makes sense, kind of self-explanatory. It's the thing that publishes values. You have a subscriber, which also is somewhat self-explanatory. It's something that receives these values. You have a subscription, which is the contract uh, that a, a subscriber enters into with the uh, publisher. And then you have a processor interface, which implements both the subscriber and the publisher interface, so it can uh, take a value, uh, act on it, do something with it, manipulate it, and then pass it on to its subscribers. So it's very simple. It's very granular. It's, it's really too granular to be useful in and of itself. I mean, for starters, it's in, these are interfaces, so you do have to still provide an implementation. Uh, but it's, again, that very granular level. So, at some point, in order to really use this, you've got to put some code behind it, right? Now, you can code your own implementation. There's a lot involved. As you, might, as you might imagine, there are a lot of moving parts. Probably not the best recommendation to do. But there are implementations, things like Aka Streams and RxJava, and in our case, Project Reactor. Uh, so what is Project Reactor? Uh, this is kind of the spring entrance into the field. Now, it's not just us. We have committers from a lot of different companies. Uh, we do cross-pollinate. We do work closely with a lot of other folks on the other teams. Uh, I like to point out that David Carnock, who's the head of RxJava 2.x, 2, uh, 2 I should say now, um, is a, a heavy committer into Project Reactor. So we get along, right? We all try to work together and, and better the, uh, the whole field. Uh, but we all have perhaps a little bit different way of doing things. Project Reactor, I think, does a lot of things right. I'm biased. You make your own decisions. But uh, we, for starters, we base everything on the Java 8 API, right? So if you're used to dealing with the Java 8 functional API, completable streams, uh, lambdas, things like that, uh, duration, uh, this feels like a very natural extension of that. Uh, we also, in terms of publishers, in the Java world, you typically return a value from a method, right? Or a collection of values. And the same thing kind of goes when you're talking about uh, publishers, right? You can return, in our case, a mono, which is you're expecting zero or one values. That's a specialization of publisher. Uh, or you can return a flux. A flux is a publisher of zero to n values, perhaps even over 
an, an undefined number of values over an indeterminate amount of time. Now, some operations make sense for both. Some operations make sense only in terms of one or the other. So it kind of makes sense to specialize. Uh, in the Spring world, we call this whole library that provides this capability in Spring Framework 5 and Spring Boot 2 Project Webflux. I hate the name. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest. Well, I don't hate it. That's a little strong. I didn't like the name. I expressed my doubts. I was outvoted. I'm not bitter. <laughs> to me, it makes me think of a vacuum cleaner. But anyway, uh, it is searchable. There are a lot of other advantages to it. It's very quick for us developers to get on and search stuff with the name Webflux. It's unique. Uh, and it does catch, right? It makes sense because it's based on the Flux publisher. So that's kind of where we throw it in. Now, you don't have to use Spring to use Project Reactor. It's a dependency of Spring, not the other way around. Uh, but of course, who wouldn't want to use Spring, right? Uh, really? OK, anyway. Uh, and it's all based, obviously, uh, it builds on HTTP, uses uh, server sent events, WebSocket, TCP, UDP. I mean, you've got the whole, whole, whole ball game in there. So. With that, let's code. Does anyone recognize this guy, by the way? Oh, good. OK. I always worry a little when I go into a room and I ask that, and everyone's looking at me like, for those of you who don't, first let me say I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. If you're a Doctor Who fan, you probably got that reference too. But any Doctor Who fans I should ask? Good. OK. Well, you'll, you'll get some stuff later that the rest of you, again, I'm so sorry, will not get. Uh, but. Uh, this is from the IT crowd. It's a uh, Britcom uh, from a few years ago, and it is awesome. Uh, is it on Netflix, available on Netflix here? I'm not sure. I, I always talk about it wherever I go. And I, I, I spoke in Mexico not that long ago, and sadly, it's not. So I told them, you have to find another way to watch this. It's too awesome. Uh, but it's, it's actually a little dated uh, from a few years ago now, but it is, it is so much our lives, right? I mean, you'll watch this, and you'll laugh, you'll cry, you know, you'll, <laughs> you'll relate. Uh, but it's an awesome, awesome show. This is one of the protagonists, Maurice Moss. Uh, you have a weekend coming up. Just block it and binge watch, OK? Do yourself a favor. All right. So with that, um, let's start into things. I'm going to take a quick drink here. OK. So how are we gonna, doing on time? We have until 9. Well, that's great. OK, we've got plenty of time then. OK. So. Um, so this is our starting point, right? This is the Spring Initializer. Does anyone recognize this site? For those of you who don't, for the two of you who don't, that's fine. Uh, this is your starting point for Spring Boot-based microservices on the net. You don't have to go here to create a Spring Boot project, but it helps, right? So you can do it all manually if you want. Or you can curl this or use the Spring command line interface. Or you can just go here. I like to go to the website because it's so pretty. OK, just like I have not a great sense of humor, I also don't have a great eye. But this does work really well, OK? So we're going to start here to create our Spring Boot projects. Now, this doesn't generate any code. What it does is allow you to make certain logical selections on dependencies, and then it zips it up, you download it, and you get started. I guess it does actually create your main class and your main method. Uh, that's it. But it's a, it's a, le a starting off point. It, it just kind of gets you started fast. So um, it's opinionated, like all Spring projects are. Uh, where you can uh, very easily get started if you fall within that 80 to 90% use case. But if you don't, if you want to go crazy and go manual and choose all the selections by hand, you can. That's great. We just don't have that much time. So I'm going to shorten things a little bit and just go with the simple version. I'm a simple guy. That's cool. So let's start off. Uh, now, you do still do ha have some options, even at the very simple level. Uh, so if you're a Maven developer, you can generate a Maven project. If you're a hipster, you can generate a Gradle project. It's OK. It's OK. I, I actually, my, my, my hoodie is in my bag, so I'm going to stay with Maven for now. But I might do Gradle another time, so just, you know, we'll see. But it's all right. You can go there. So I'm going to choose Maven. Uh, you can also choose to use Java, Kotlin, or Groovy. Any Kotlin fans in here? Yay. OK. I will come back to you here later on, uh, because I do have a code repo that I link. And I, I code all this in Java, and I code it all again in Kotlin. So if you're, uh, if you're curious, it's out there. Uh, so we're going to stay with Java today just to kind of stay down that mainstream path. Uh, we're going to use the current version of Spring Boot, which is 2.0.3. And I'm going to uh, just kick things off. I'm going to change that from example to the hecklers. Uh, so that way, at least we have the proper domain here. So and packaging. So now our artifact. This is where it gets tough. My colleague Josh Long and I came up with a, what we thought was a, an all new cool thing to do 
to, to demonstrate the power of Project Reactor. And we, we brainstormed this for at least 15, 20 minutes. So this was a great idea, right? So I'm a big, again, I mentioned uh, earlier, I'm a big his, history buff, movie buff. I like movie quotes, right? So I'm hitting him with tons and tons of movie quotes, as I am wont to do. And he says, you know, let's, this is all his idea, OK? Let's create a service that will stream movies over to the internet because that's never been done before, right? So we did this. We called it Netflix. And, and we just started fielding this, and, and some little guy in a suit showed up on the front door, and he handed us a cease and desist letter. So that was a little disappointing. So we changed the name. Same little guy in the suit comes back. So uh, to make a short story long, uh, I decided that probably we shouldn't venture into the whole streaming movies thing. But uh, I thought, what do I love, right? Because you should always do what you love. That's what the, the, the people tell you to do, is follow your heart. So I'm going to create a coffee service today. Any other coffee fans in here? Yeah, people hate coffee. Yeah, good. OK. Um, I love coffee. So anyway, this is, this is my favorite part of the whole day. All right, after drinking coffee. So I'm going to start by defining a few dependencies. I'm going to bring in the first the dependency for reactive web. Uh, anybody here, I guess I should have asked this first, anybody here a Spring MVC developer? OK. So you're used to you know, dealing with Tomcat for your, for your um, uh, servlet container, right? Uh, that's the default. But as with any Spring Boot project, you can swap that out for Undertow or Jetty or what have you. Uh, same thing here. Uh, but we default to Netty for the reactive part. For, for Webflux. Uh, you can swap that out again for any uh, Servlet 3.1 compatible engine. So things like Tomcat 8 or Undertow or Jetty, all are fine. Uh, but, but we start off with Netty because it just kind of makes sense, right? Netty pioneered this area and does really well at it. Uh, and it also gets you a dependency for Spring Webflux, as we'd mentioned. Uh, I'm also going to bring in, uh, let's see, I'm going to bring in reactive MongoDB because we need a database. And I love Mongo. Is, it, is anybody here who works for MongoDB? Mongo? You do? OK, good. Because I love Mongo. Mongo is super fast. It's, it's so fast, sometimes it's like it doesn't even save the data. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I do pick on my friends. So my friend, you're in trouble today. I'm sorry. I'm just going to warn you now. But anyway, so I'm going to use Mongo. I love Mongo. I am also going to use something that I find really cool. Uh, actually, it's. Embedded MongoDB. Now this, has anybody heard of this? There's, there's a, a German guy who created this uh, library called Flapdoodle. It's embedded MongoDB. Now, first of all, I know what you're thinking. No German has a good enough sense of humor to name anything Flapdoodle, right? But it, this guy exists. He really exists. I connected with him on Zing, so I know he's real. Okay? But anyway, I just love it because with a name like Flapdoodle, I mean, you can't even say that without smiling, right? Flapdoodle. Flap, wow, OK, tough crowd. I can't say it without smiling. All right, so I'm also going to use Lombok because I'm a lazy developer. Lazy good, not lazy bad, right? Uh, Lombok helps me cut down on the boilerplate code. And I'm still learning things about Lombok. I couldn't believe I've used it off and on for years. And I just saw, not that long ago, that you actually have the capability to find vol vowels and vars with Lombok from like, 0.8 version years ago. So if you were thinking Java 10 for my var or Kotlin, you don't even have to go there. Not that I'm discouraging you from doing Kotlin. Kotlin's awesome. But, but anyway, so I'm going to use Lombok here today because it kind of short circuits things. That's always nice. I'm going to save this down. If it ever comes down, did I lose my connection? No, there it is. OK, so we'll just save that to the desktop. All right, so I'm going to unzip this. Open up my project and my favorite IDE, NetBeans. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> All kidding aside, I like NetBeans too. I will pick on them a little bit. Uh, but, but NetBeans and Eclipse have excellent support for Spring Boot projects. Uh, there's a guy, I think, out of Italy, uh, Alex Falapa, who does a, just a yeoman's job on, on uh, you know, the Spring Boot annotations and support within NetBeans. So, so I joke about it. But again, love NetBeans too. Uh, but I do, IntelliJ actually kind of fits with my, um, um, with my workflow and my uh, usage patterns better. So that's what I'll stick with today. I do need to blow this up. Let's see. Let's apply that. Uh, can we see that in the back? Let's see. Let's open that. Is that readable? 
That's my ambiguous setting, so that's, that's huge, right? All right, so we'll start there. Uh, so uh, let's see, this is a coffee service, so we should start with our domain, which will probably be something like coffee, right? Naming is the hardest problem in computer science. Uh, so I'm going to first create uh, a few little attributes of a coffee that we might keep track of, like its ID, uh, also maybe string. I should also point out, those of you in the front row, front couple rows, I sometimes typo. It happens. I type fast. Sometimes my brain's faster than my fingers. So if you see me typo, yell it out before I hit build. Otherwise, it's, on your, it's your fault. Especially you. You brought in ice cream earlier, and you didn't even bring me one. So, you know. All right. So, OK. So, so we're going to create a coffee class. Uh, I'm going to, again, store this in, in uh, Mongo. So I'm going to make this a document class. I'm also going to, since I'm using Lombok, make this a data class. That gives me things like uh, my getters and setters, my equals, my hash code, my two string. I'm also going to ask uh, Lombok to provide a noargs constructor and an allargs constructor. Uh, so that's kind of nice right out of the box. I'm also going to indicate that's my ID field. And that gets us largely our, our basic domain anyway, right? So we're going to start with a minimum viable product and roll out quickly. Now, that's OK. But we need some operational visibility into this, right? Because if we're going to create the coffee service to end all coffee services, we need to be able to track the orders for each individual coffee. So if we have 1,000 orders a second coming in for a particular kind of coffee, we may want to carry coffees that are similar to that coffee, right? So we can boost sales. It's all about, it's all about the sales, right? But if we have a coffee that's only being ordered once a year, we can probably drop that out of our catalog. So we need to have some information about coffee orders. So we'll create a coffee order class. Uh, order. Saved you that time. OK. Uh, we will want to have some information like the coffee ID, right? And then we also want to uh, know when a particular coffee order took place. So date ordered, ordered. There we go. OK. And once again, uh, we're going to annotate this as at data, at norgs instructor, and allargs instructor. Now, we will need a repository. Uh, Spring, uh, Spring Data has a concept of repository. Spring Boot allows for really nice auto config. So we're going to create a coffee repository interface, and we'll extend our reactive CRUD repository, which is an interface defined in Spring Data. Now, sometimes people look at Spring Boot when they're coming in fresh, and I did it too. No, no attribution there. But they look at it and they say, there's so much magic there. Oh, I'm used to seeing all this code, and now you have a few annotations, and it all, it all works, but I don't know why. Here's, here's a hint. Arthur C. Clarke said it best. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. It's all just technology, OK? So I'm going to pull back the covers a little bit. Spring Boot will make certain logical assumptions based on your code, your annotations, your class path, right? And what it does when it sees, when you, when you do a build, when you run your program, is Spring Boot sees that you've extended an interface to find in Spring Data. And when it sees you've done that and you have a database driver on your class path, it makes the crazy assumption that you want to talk to a database. I mean, this isn't hard, right? This is not a really tough, tough leap. But this is auto configuration going to work for you. You can tailor it. You can tweak it. You can completely override it and do it manually if you want to. But why? Why? So we're going to extend our interface. We're going to be storing items of type coffee with IDs of type string. And that gets us some basic repository functionality right out of the box. Now, uh, we want to do a few things. I want to load some data. Being a very visual person, we have a working application now, hopefully. But we don't have any way to see that. So I'm going to uh, create a component here. I'm going to call this my data loader. And I'm going to inject my coffee repository and constructor injection. Best, best case scenario here. Uh, best practices, I guess. I kind of hate that term, but we'll go with it. Uh, so I'm going to create a post construct method, private void. Again, visibility is low. And we're going to load some data. Now, this is a coffee service. And this is, the, this is the absolute best part of the whole talk. So I peak early, right? But this is the audience participation part. Remember, garbage in, garbage out. So if you don't give me something good to work with, it's going to be just downhill from here. So we're going to create a flux, which is a publisher, right? We're going to create a flux of just these values. Does anyone have a favorite coffee? A good coffee. None of the, none of the cheap stuff, OK? Good coffees. 
What, what is it? You, you have to shout it out, man. Americana. Okay, we can deal with that in honor, in honor of my new best friend here. Okay, so let's see. Uh, actually, Abraham was telling me about an, an excellent coffee that I can't wait to try as soon as I can find it called Esmeralda. See? Excellent coffee. So I'm told. Okay. There's one from my hometown of St. Louis, kind of in the center of the U.S. Uh, it's called Kali's Coffee. Uh, Kali has a coffee roaster there. Uh, and it's, it's quite good. If you get a chance to try it someday, please do. Uh, anyone else have a favorite coffee? Café au lait. Café au lait. Hmm. Is that a good one? Okay, we'll go with that. Café. And I love this part because I get to show off my, my wicked uh, keywords. Au lait, once again. <laughs> Look at that. Yeah, baby. All right. Anyone else? What? what? Spell it for me, please. Oh, okay. Well, it's, that's what I thought you were saying, but I thought, no, it can't be that simple. It's like my name. Anytime you exchange names, it's like it's Mark. It's just, just Mark. I felt like it was too easy, so, yeah. Anyone else? Java. Java. <laughs> I like that. Okay, yeah. You're in the right room. Excellent. Okay. Okay, we'll stop there for now, but if anyone has one that they just really, they think of later and they love it, yell it out. We'll stop. We'll go back. It's that important, okay? So, we have some, some of our favorite coffees right here. I'm going to take each of those coffee names, and I'm going to map each of those, as soon as I can type, map each of those. That's a coffee name, so we're going to create a new coffee object, right? Uh, I'm going to use UUID to create an ID uh, and then pass that name, so that will map each one of those names to a new coffee, right? And then I'm going to flat map that. Uh, so we're going to take each of those copy, coffees, <laughs> I'll get it right here, and do a repo save. I'm doing a method reference here just to shorten things up a bit. And, and if we were doing a non-reactive type of approach, we'd just do that, right? But what happens if we don't have a terminal operation in reactive programming? It's like a stream, right? It's lazy, like I am. It doesn't do anything until you, until you subscribe to it. And this is very important because this, and I'm going to tell you something that's technically wrong here, but we're going to go with it just for the purpose of the example, and then we can clarify later. Publishers generally are cold publishers, so no work takes place until they have a subscriber. Why is that important? Because if you have a ton of publishers spinning up and doing all this kind of crazy work in your application and nobody's listening, why? It's a huge waste of resources. So we're going to subscribe, and that's when the party kicks off, right? We don't even have to do anything here. We can just say subscribe, and that's good enough. But again, being very visual people, we like to do a system out print line so we can see what's going on. And that's OK. But we have a problem here, not a bug, because I make sure never to bug my code. That way, I don't have to debug my code. Saves a lot of time, just a pro tip, right? But we have a small problem, because I'm going to be start, stopping and restarting this several times. And each time I do that, it's going to try to save the same records over and over again. And I know we're using Mongo, so not all of them may save. But you know, I mean, there, it may happen. There, a couple of them may take, right? We have to be careful. So. He's being a great sport about this. I love this. Next time, I'll pick on you know, Couchbase or something. It's all good. Lot, lots of love. Anyway, so I'm going to just start off by doing a repo.delete all. And once again, if we were doing an imperative application, we could just do this, right? But, but we can't because we're asynchronous here. Because we don't know that that will finish before the next statement starts. So we need to somehow do something to make that happen. Now, we can do this. Don't you feel dirty when you see that? I mean, this is non-blocking code. And if you start littering your non-blocking code with block statements, with block methods, you should probably question your life choices, right? So I'm going to remove that. We need something, though, that kind of does a similar type thing. We need to wait for the all clear from our upstream methods and then proceed. There are several options. I like then many because it takes a publisher as the next parameter. We just happen to have a publisher right here, right? A flux is a publisher. And that, that's nice. That's pretty good. Right now, though, what happens is, though, that we're actually just printing out each one as we add it. It would be really nice to validate that truly this is all we have in our data store. So what I'm going to do is just do another then many, just chain them, right? Why not? And do a repo.find all. And now, now we should be able to verify that this is truly all that we have in our data store now. So let's kick off the party here. Hmm. What did I forget? So I have something wrong here. No server chosen by Mongo. 
<sighs> really? Come on. Okay. So let me uh, go to my palm and see what's off here. Oh, yes. I forgot. This was something they tightened up. <sighs> Darn data team. All right. So I'm going to restart this. By default, flap doodle. Flap doodle. Flap doodle. Okay, anyway. By default, flap doodle assumes a, uh, a test scope. Uh, we want it to be running all the time for this application. I mean, I can run a local version of Mongo, but I love Flap Doodle, so why not? So we have here our coffees that have been saved, so everything looks like it's working, and that's great. Uh, but at this point, we just, we, we're interacting with our data store reactively, but that's it. We've done nothing more. So we have 12 minutes to build out our coffee service. We can do this, okay? So easy peasy. The first thing we want to do is create our internal service API. So I'm going to create a coffee service, coffee service. I'm going to inject my coffee repository bean, and then let's define our minimum viable API, right? So I'm going to, let's see, we'll want to return a flux of all coffees, right? Get all coffees. That seems valuable, useful. Uh, return uh, repo.findall. Straight pass through. So fast, so easy. Uh, we also want to return a mono of type coffee, right? So we can grab a, a particular coffee. Uh, let's see, get coffee by ID, of course, specifying, specifying the ID. They cannot be done already. Oh my. We'll take their extra time. OK, so I'm going to return repo.find by ID, passing the ID. That's great. Uh, what else? Oh, our operational visibility, right? So we'll want to return a flux of coffee orders. Uh, so get orders, orders, uh, orders by, again, string. String coffee ID. Uh, so now, if we had millions of subscribers, this would be very easy, right? We just kind of grab what's in our in-memory database, and we just spit out all the orders that are taking place as they come live. We don't have a million subscribers yet. In fact, we don't have a subscriber yet. So you know, we're going to have to kind of fake this till we make it. I'm going to just generate some values to look like we have subscribers on the hope that eventually we'll get seed funding and you know, take over the world with this. Uh, so we're going to do a return flux.generate, and let's generate some values. So I'm going to create a sync and do a sync.next, create some new coffee orders uh, using our coffee ID. Uh, and let's see, oh, also uh, instant.now, so we can just generate these. And, and as it stands right now, this will generate a ton of coffee orders, just as fast as this little MacBook can run, right? Uh, but, uh, which is great for, you know, for systems, but not so great for us seeing it. So I'm going to slow things down just a little bit to delay the elements so we can get uh, maybe about one per second so we can see them as they flow through. Now, IntelliJ is telling me it thinks that I have a flux of objects here until I specify particularly coffee orders. So this looks like it should work. If only there were some way some way to test code before you put it into production. If only there were some way to test code. Anyway, I was, I was talking to Abraham earlier, and he said, you know, there's this key combination I like to use. And, and he, wasn't, he was nice enough not to make fun of me, but he did tell me I should try this, so let's, I'm going to try this. Oh, look, it, it works. You were absolutely right. So apparently, we can create tests. We can test this code which is nice, right? I never lead with tests because nobody would ever come. But uh, we're going to start off with a test. We're going to just test this one method and make sure it works. We figure the pass-throughs work. We'll assume that they will. But we can write tests for those two. Uh, I'm not going to have time today, but we can circle back. That's in the repo, right? So I'm going to auto-wire in uh, my coffee service. Uh, and we're going to uh, get started with that. So first thing to do is have reasonable descriptive names for your tests, right? So get orders. And we're going to take 10 and just see how that works. So we need a string. We need a coffee ID, right? So we'll create a coffee ID. We'll use our service to get all coffees, block first, and get the ID from that. Now, unit tests are the one area where it's, it's OK to block in a reactive application. The reason being that Imperative applications are relatively much easier to test. I say relatively, right? Because you typically you make a request, you get a response, you validate what you got versus what you expected, and you move on. Now, with a publisher, and in, in, in reactive programming, it kind of works that way for the most part. But what happens when you have a sporadic publisher? If you expect values for who knows how long, who knows how many? 
you could get three values in three seconds and then another value in a minute and another value in a week. That makes for some exceedingly long unit tests, right? So we need to have some way to compress that. Here's the good news. Between this, and we're, in this case, all we're doing is just telling our data store to give us back all the records but stop after the first one. We don't even care which one. Just grab any old coffee. It's fine. Um, the other thing that we have with Reactor is the ability to time travel. So who are my Whovians? I feel so bad because I normally dress appropriately for this. All I wore was, was this shirt. I normally wear a Dr. Who shirt when I give this talk. But, um, but we're going to time travel. It's so cool. So uh, this is the second best part of the whole talk, after the coffees, right? So we're going to start off and use our friend step verifier, step verifier dot with virtual time. This is great because we can compress time. Uh, so I'm going to create a supplier here and use my service to get coffees, get all orders, I should say, for this particular coffee ID. I'm going to take 10. This is an example, a very simple example, by the way, of back pressure. I'm just having my subscriber specify to my publisher that it can only take 10 values. Just give me 10, no more, no less, just stop at 10. And that brings us in on scope a little bit, which is kind of nice. I'm then going to await a certain amount of time. Now, we wrote this code, so we know we're going to get one value every second. But we're time travelers, right? So we can, we can be a little, you know, a little on the excessive side and be safe. We'll, we'll wait 10 hours. Should be fine. OK, so we're going to wait 10 hours. And then I'm going to just check. Uh, in this case, I'm going to just see that I got 10 values. I'm asking for 10. I'm going to verify I got 10. And then let's just verify complete. So let's run this. And we should get a green bar, right? If everything is working, we should get a green bar. Yay, we got a green bar. Our test passed. Now that means one of two things. Either our code works or our test doesn't. So we need to verify. I always like to verify that my test is testing what I think it's testing. So I'm going to change this to expecting 11 values. I'm still asking for 10, but I'm expecting 11. So we should get a red bar. So let's, let's hope we get a red bar. Feels really weird to root for a red bar here. But OK, so it worked, or didn't work, as the case may be. Uh, so I'm going to change this back, because I'm a little OCD, and just make sure that we leave our tests in a consistent state. And this should go green again. Yes, OK, so we're good there. Now, there's, there's a much greater testing story to tell with Project Reactor, including web test client and things like that. Not any time here today, but again, my repo has a little bit more along those lines. So at some point, please check that out. But let's get back to our code. So now we have our internal API defined. We have our, interactive, our, our database interactions fully reactive. Let's define our external API. Now, for who, who are my Spring MVC developers in here? So you're used to seeing REST controllers, right? This is very familiar. Now, this is the thing that I feel like we did really well on the Spring team. We created parallel packaging. So we have Spring Web MVC and Spring Web Flux, and we duplicated. MVC is not going away. There are a lot of mission critical applications running around the world on Spring MVC. But we are also not telling you that you have to take all of your 10 plus years of hard won knowledge and throw it away and start fresh just to take advantage of a reactive stack. So this will seem very familiar to you. Uh, if you're used to creating REST controllers, guess what? You can still do this. Uh, I'm going to use request mapping to indicate that everything falls under my coffees, URI, to start off with, right? And I'm going to create my coffee controller, coffee controller. And let's see, so private, final, final coffee service. I'm going to inject my coffee service so I can use my internal API for my external API, right? Code reuse is a good thing. Uh, now I'm going to do a get mapping, and let's, let's create a method that returns a flux of coffees again. Uh, we'll just call this all. Return service.get all coffees. Again, pass through. Very simple. We're leveraging code we've written and built, and presumably at some point tested, right? So I'm going to do another one to get map uh, the, uh, the ID, buy a particular ID to get a particular coffee, right? Uh, so public mono of coffee. Uh, by ID, we're going to use path variable to extract that ID, and then we'll return service dot get coffee by ID, right? And then finally, let's see, our other one was to return our coffee orders. So get mapping slash ID slash orders. Now, public flux of coffee orders in this case, uh, orders. Once again, using a path variable to extract the ID. 
return, return, service.getOrders for our ID. And that's almost enough. But REST controllers, by default, assume that they get all values, they bundle them up, and they ship them back in a single document. We actually know that we're going to be sending back one value per second ad infinitum. So how do we do that? Well, we, you can use WebSocket. You can use server sent events. But in this case, I mean, it's a natural fit for server sent events. We're producing one value per second just until heat death of the universe, right? So we're going to produce, we're going to indicate we're producing a media type of text event stream value. And that indicates to our REST controller to produce a stream of server sent events. So let's go ahead and run this, and we'll see what we get. We, how, how much time do we have? Two minutes. We can do this. This is fine. OK. So let's test this, make sure it works. Uh, let's see, blow this up just a bit more. And I use HTTP. Uh, let's hit our coffee's endpoint. And that all works, right? We knew it would. We don't make mistakes. Live coding, everything always works. So I'm going to check our particular coffee. So we pull this down. That works. Now let's see if we get our coffee orders and see if we stream those. Bam. OK, so everything's coming through exactly as it should. But we have a minute. We can fix that, right? So uh, I won't have time to show you the client, but I would like to show you that if you are, are not coming from a Spring MVC perspective, if you're coming from a functional uh, reactive type of approach, you can change this out. Uh, you know what? We are right on 5 o'clock. I will leave it to you as an exercise to check out the repo, because I actually show both ways of doing things. It's very nice. You can define your own uh, functional routing, which is pretty slick. Uh, so let's go back, and we'll finish up here. Because sometimes I forget to show this, and I want to make sure I get to that. This is it, right? Uh, if you're interested in more information about the Reactive Streams initiative, all the information, all the goodies are up at the top link. Project Reactor, we have excellent documentation. So that is an, a, a really good place to look. Every, all the API information, the, uh, the Java doc, the full textual explanation, how to, to debug, how to set up checkpoints, how to do everything you'd possibly want to do, uh, tweak the scheduler. It's all in there. We did a really nice job on the docs, I, I will say. And then finally, all the code you saw here and much, much more uh, in both Java and Kotlin, fork, service, and a client <laughs> are out in the bottom repo. Uh, that, uh, th that does have submodules, so be careful when you pull it down that you actually do the full thing to get all the submodules so you get all the code. But please do check it out, and please do let me know what you think of it. Happy to, uh, happy to get feedback. So uh, once we get the shot there, okay. So thanks for coming, and uh, go to. Yeah.